When I lived in Sussex, I used to go to Brighton quite a lot, and Brighton is famous for many things, uh, some good, some bad. We won't talk about the bad. But one of the things it is famous for is that it has two piers. There's Brighton Pier, which is fully functioning, tourist attraction, has all the things that piers have with the candy floss and the slot machines and everything like that. And then there is the West Pier, which sadly is in a very sorry state. It has been derelict for many, many years and became famous again because in the 1970s, a huge storm took away the central bit of the pier. So the pier now stands in two places with this great chasm of sea flowing through the middle of it. So consequently, no one is ever allowed on it. And it's rather sad to see this. And I often used to try and imagine what it used to be like in its former days. Now, unfortunately, it's become a bit of a white elephant. No one really knows what to do with this pier. If they talk about pulling it down, then all the preservation societies start rioting and saying they're going to sue them, and you can't do that because it's a magnificent Victorian structure, even though it's falling into the sea. But it just costs too much to rebuild it. We're talking millions to rebuild it. And once uh, Brighton Council had this great idea of putting it up for sale for a pound. <laughs> but if you bought it for a pound, you had to guarantee that you'd spend at least two million restoring it. So consequently, it still remains with the big divide in the middle. But imagine how foolish it would be. Just imagine for a moment that somebody did come along and restore the pier. But everybody that worked on the pier stopped at the point where there used to be a hole and said to themselves, traditionally, this is where it stopped, therefore I'm going no further. Or imagine if the residents of Brighton decided, this is our pier and we're going to go right through to the very end, but we're going to stop anybody who dares any foreigner, tourist, who dares to cross this divide because it's ours and no one else is allowed here. Now, as foolish as that may seem, this is a similar dilemma to what Paul was facing with the church in Ephesus. In fact, he wasn't just the church in Ephesus. He seemed to be facing it in many of the early churches. What he was facing was the great circumcision war. To be circumcised or not to be circumcised, that is the question. They could never decide what the right thing was. Because in the past, in the old law, only the Jews had access to God. And only circumcised Jews had access to God. The Gentiles, the non-Jews, consequently who weren't circumcised, had very little access to God at all. And in the temple, the great temple of Solomon's day particularly, they were just allowed in at the back with the women and the children. They weren't allowed anywhere near the Holy of Holies, which was where God resided. And they just could not understand or fathom the fact that this had all gone through Christ. That when Christ died on the cross, he took away the sin of the world. Not just the Jewish sin, not just the Gentile sin, but sin of mankind, and therefore gave complete and utter access to God. As it were, Christ divided that gap. He bridged that gap, so there was absolutely no divide, there was absolutely no barrier to stop people having full access to God. And the one thing that people 
had forgotten or had overlooked was a very significant thing that happened when Jesus died on the cross on Good Friday. And that was the fact that the temple curtain was ripped in two. Imagine, I have a visual aid tonight. You can see I've put a lot of work into this. Imagine that this is the temple curtain. Everything this side of the temple curtain is fine. That's where man dwelt. That's where worshippers dwelt. Everything behind the temple curtain, and I'm glad you've cleared the space, obviously new, was where God lived. And no one was allowed through this curtain except the priest once a year. Now, I'm sure I wouldn't qualify to be my, have an annual visitation with God as a female, so only John was allowed in, really, shall we say. The moment Christ died on the cross, the very moment, the skies became dark. And God did an amazing thing. The temple curtain was ripped in half. No man did it because it was ripped from top to bottom. And that curtain was no longer there. So you now have total access to God. There was no division anymore. But sadly, the man-made divisions in the temple that prevented the Gentiles coming any nearer didn't fall down. They were for man to, to pull down. But of course they never did. And this was the problem. They didn't get that they had total access to God. And having access to God also gave us peace. In verse 15, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. When we talk about peace, we're not talking about, well, now we're a Christian, we're going to have a good life. Nothing is going to happen to us. Everything's going to be really hunky-dory from now on because I know everybody can testify to the fact that doesn't happen. We still have troubles. We still have pain. We still have persecution. But the peace that God gives us is that assurance that he is with us, that we have that access to him, and he's always going to be there by our side. He's never going to leave us. We don't have to do anything in order to come into his presence. We haven't got that great void between us. We have total access with God who will get us through in our lives. But more than that, he makes us into citizens. He gives us identity. It says, verse 19, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and, raises, and rises to become a temple of the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. I've got a friend called Michelle. She's Australian and she, lived, she worked and lived in England for many years. But because she was Australian, she kept having to renew her visa in order to, to stay in the country. She eventually married an Englishman. And the greatest day, apart from her wedding day, was the day she got her citizenship. And she said, it isn't because I feel less Australian or more British. She didn't suddenly start liking Marmite as opposed to Vegemite an argument we've had with her for many years. But she said, 
I feel accepted. I feel I have got foundational roots now in this country. And I've got a passport to prove it. Something changed in Michelle the day she got that citizenship. She knew she felt part of the United Kingdom. She felt she belonged. No longer had she got to go through endless paperwork. No longer had she had to come against masses of red tape, which somehow Michelle always seemed to encounter. She had a right to be here. She was a sense of belonging. And that's what God gives his people, a sense of belonging, a citizenship into the kingdom of God. Now, to go back to Brighton Pier. A bit more to the story. A few years ago, there was a devastating fire on that pier that took away all the remaining buildings. And I was there a few weeks ago, and now all that remains is just some mangled metal. I've got no idea if the Heritage Society still thinks that's worth preserving, but to everybody else, you can tell that it's now a building that's not fit for purpose. It once had glory, but now there's no glory left. And really, the most sensible thing to do is to pull it down. But Christ's building is not like Brighton Pier. It will never fall down. Let's have a look at those final verses. Starting from verse 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. God is building a new temple that has no divisions, that has no walls. There's no sign saying Jews only. There's no sign saying men only. There's no sign saying no coloreds. Everyone has total access. And like Brighton Pier, it will never fall down, no matter how strong the storm is, because it's been built on the foundation of the apostles and with Christ as the cornerstone, holding it all together. We have the Spirit in our hearts to give us strength. We have total access to God. We have peace in our hearts. We have that assurance that we are fellow citizens, an identity and a belonging. What more can you have than that? And if you're saying now, well, surely this is no longer relevant. We've solved the circumcision law many, many years ago. Let me tell you, this is just as relevant today as it ever has been. While ever there's division, while ever there's persecution... While ever there are asylum seekers looking for somewhere to dwell in safety, while ever there are wars, while ever there is prejudice, while ever there's injustice, these words are just as important. And it's the important thing is that we keep preaching them. We keep telling people that we have freedom in Christ and total access to God. These are the only words we need to say to people. And if you want proof that this is working and that there's evidence of working, I want to leave you with a verse out of Revelation. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The greatest worship session we will ever experience. 
everybody from every nation, tribe, people and language standing in unity before the throne and before the Lamb, worshipping the Lord. But it's up to us to make that happen. It's up to us to go to every nation, tribe, people and language and tell them about the freedom they have in Christ. I can't wait to be there and to experience that. I hope you feel the same. Amen.